and decide, let's, let's just give our voices to God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I'm just so grateful and thankful for them. And I'm grateful for the musicians. Amen. Yeah. I've always have been in a mindset where it is, it's okay that the hymn of meditation be um, It's okay in some situations. But I always thought if a brother going to get up and preach, you better preach to something that's upbeat. You know, um, that's just me. I, I'm not from the old school. Because I almost got up when, when the brothers got to go in there, I almost got into my. I had to catch myself. Because I was just getting ready to do this. That Baptist dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All he had to do was tickle it a little bit more. No, if y'all would have saw me running back and forth. The drums started getting in my head, and I started to put my one leg. Because I always believe you got to get up, you better get on up with some fire. Mark chapter 2, verse 7. 
Only God can forgive sins. Dealing with my sins is God's responsibility. I repent, I confess, but only God can forgive. The second proclamation. Only God can judge my neighbor. Romans chapter 14, verse 4. You cannot judge another person's servant. The master decides if the servant is doing well or not. Dealing with my neighbor is God's responsibility. I must speak. I must pray, but only God can convince. And he does. The third proclamation. I must accept who God accepts. Be quiet on that one. Christ accepted you, so we should accept each other which will bring glory to God. God loves me and makes me his child. God loves my neighbor and makes him my brother or sister. My privilege is to complete the triangle, to close the circuit and be loving as God loves those who are around me. Easier said than done. Yeah, yeah. To live above with those who we love, oh, how that will be glory. To live below with those we know, now that's another story. God has enlisted us in his Navy and placed us on his ship. The boat has one purpose, to carry us safely to the other shore. This is no cruise ship. Someone's going on a cruise here soon. Amen. I told them to enjoy themselves. Stay away from all the food. Because he'll come back five pounds heavier. You say you can do that. But there's so much food on that ship. This is not a cruise ship, though. It's a battleship. We are called to a life of leisure. We are called to a life of service. Each of us has a different task. Some are concerned with those who are drowning and are snatching people from the water. Others are occupied with the enemy, so they stay manned up and ready to man the cannons of prayer and worship. Still others devote themselves to the crew, feeding and training the crew members. Though different, we are all the same. Each can tell of a personal encounter with the captain, for each has received an, a personal call. He found us among the shanties of the seaport and invited us to follow him. Our faith was born at the sight of his fondness, and so we went with him. We each followed him across the gangplank of his grace unto this same boat. There is one captain and one destination. Though the battle is fierce, the boat is safe. For our captain is God. The ship will not sink. For that there is no concern. There is concern, however, 
regarding the disharmony of the crew. When we first boarded, we, we assumed the crew was made up of others like us. But as we wandered these decks, we've encountered curious converts and curious appearances. Some wear uniforms we've never seen. Others are sporting styles we've never witnessed. Why do you look the way you do? We asked them, and the response is funny. We were about to ask you the same question. I was driving somewhere and listening to a young man's song that came on Kirk Franklin's station. And he began to say he stopped going to church because people talked about his clothing. And he asked the question within the song, which is more important, my soul or my clothes? It made me begin to think that I've been so critical of people with their pants past their butts that I began to realize that I've been too concerned of their clothes rather than their soul. I really believe that once you get into Christ and Christ gets into you, somehow the pants begin to come back up to where side. I understand. I grew up in my teenage years and we all wanted to look like one another. If one guy wore a turtleneck and had his shirt open, by the next week all of us was walking around school with a turtleneck with our shirt open. So my great grandmother said, son, everybody tries to mark everybody. She says, I tell you what. Today, instead of you wearing your shirt open with the turtleneck, button it all the way up and leave the turtleneck just a little bit above the collar. And so I did. Two days later, everybody else doing the same thing. And so I see and I recognize, I know that they don't fully understand. They don't recognize where that dress code came from. They don't know that that came from prison. Yes, Tupac made it popular by having his pants below his buttocks. But where that came from was that they don't give you a belt in prison. Because they're afraid you're going to hang yourself, commit suicide. So they give you any size pair of pants there is. And so guys got to either hold them up to protect themselves, or you just let it go. So while uh, Tupac got out, he just thought that was a style for everybody. So I'm just going to do it. And I tell the young men, I said, don't you know you're just emulating someone in prison? How about emulating someone that got some intelligence? That got a brain. That can think. That are going somewhere. That are, you got a place to go. They are trying to find where to go. And the sad thing is that they get so caught up into this stuff that it becomes like a recycle. It's cyclical. You're doing it over and over again. I don't know what else to do, so I go and rob somebody so I can get back in. <laughs> I didn't mean to get off on that path. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but, but the variety of dress. It's not nearly as disturbing as the plethora of opinions on the boat. There's a group, for example, who clusters every morning for serious study. They promote rigid dis discipline and they, they, they actually want to have sober expressions. Serving the captain is serious business. They explain, and it's no coincidence that, that you will find them congregating near the stern of the boat. The stern is in the front. There is another regiment deeply devoted to prayer. Not only do they believe in prayer, they believe in praying by kneeling. 
for that reason, you always know where they are located because they're in the bow of the boat, in the rear. Then there are the few who staunchly believe that real wine should be served during the Lord's Supper. You'll find them on port side. And still another group has positioned themselves near the engine. They spend hours examining the nuts and bolts of the boat. They've been known to go to low deck and not come up for days. They are occasionally criticized by those who linger on the top of the deck, feeling the wind in their hair and the sun on their face. It, it, it's, it's not what you learn, those on top side argue, it's what you feel on the inside. And oh, how we tend to cluster. Some think once you're on the boat, you can't get off. Others say you'd be foolish to go overboard, but the choice is yours. Some believe you, you actually volunteer for service. Others believe you were destined for service before the ship was even built. Some predict a storm of great tribulation will strike before we dock. Others say it won't hit until we are safe ashore. There are those who think the officers should never should wear robes, and there are those who think that they should be there should be no officers at all. And there are those who think we all are officers and all of us should wear robes. And oh, how we tend to cluster. And then there is the issue of the weekly meeting at which the captain is thanked and his words are read. All agree of its importance, but few agree on its nature. Some want it loud, others quiet. Some want rituals, others want it spontaneity. But some want to celebrate so they can meditate. Others want to meditate so that they can celebrate. Some want a meeting for those who've gone overboard. Others want to reach those overboard but without going overboard and neglecting those on board. Oh, how we tend to cluster. The consequences is a rocky boat. There is trouble on deck. Fights have broken out. Sailors have refused to speak to each other. There are even, there has even been times when one group refused to acknowledge the presence of the other group on the ship. Most tragically, some adrift at sea have chosen not to board the boat because of the quarreling of the sand. What do we do? We'd like to ask the captain, how can there be harmony on the ship? We don't have to go far for the answer. On the night, the last night of his life on earth, Jesus prayed a prayer that stands as the citadel for all Christians. John chapter 17, beginning at verse 20. I pray for these followers, but I am also praying for all those who will believe in me because of their teaching. Father, I pray that they can be one. As you are in me and I am in you, I pray that they can also be one in us. Then the world will believe that you sent me. How precious are these words. 
Jesus, knowing the end is near, prays one final time for his followers. Striking, isn't it? That he prayed not for their success. He didn't pray for their safety, nor did he pray for their happiness. He prayed for their unity. He prayed that they would be, that they would love each other. He prayed that they would love each other. And as he prayed for them, he also prayed for those who will believe because of their teaching. That means he prayed for us too. In his last prayer, Jesus prayed that you and I would be one. Of all the lessons we can draw from uh, this verse, don't miss the most important. Unity matters with God. The father does not want his kids squabbling. Disunity disturbs him. Why? Because all people will know that you are my followers if you love each other. Unity creates belief. How will the world believe that Jesus was sent by God? Not if we agree with each other. Not if we solve every controversy. Not if we are unanimous on each vote. Not if we never ever make a doctoral error. But if we love one another. Unity creates belief. Disunity fosters disbelief. Who wants to board a ship of bickering soldiers? <laughs> Life on the ocean may be rough, but at least the waves don't call us names. In his book, he authored Love Covers. Paul Bellheimer made very well be right when he says the continuous and widespread fragmentation of church has been the scandal of the ages. It has been Satan's master strategy. The sin of disunity probably has caused more souls to be lost than all other sins combined. All people, all people will know that you are my followers if you love each other. Now stop and think about this for a minute. Could it be that unity is the key to reaching the world for Christ? Could it be that SWP come together and we become so unified that it would be all over the news? I don't know what's going on over there on in Southwest, but the whole place has become Adventist. 